Behind the Curtain with Jack Burton. Welcome to Behind the Curtain. We'll be plunging into the G7 here on Behind the Curtain. Remember, if you want to take it behind the curtain, you call us 703-795-5364, 703-795-5364. Taking your emails, Jack Berkman 2016 at Gmail. Also, send us your questions for our Facebook where we answer them. That's your way of participating in the political process. And remember... If you have something you want to take to Washington, your local press won't cover it. Nobody will help you. You can turn to Behind the Curtain and we'll help you. 703-795-5364, Jack Berkman 2016 at Gmail. Now, Desmond Lackman joins us for the first time. Resident fellow, American Enterprise Institute, AEI, is an expert in global economics. Desmond, welcome to the show. Your first time with us. Thanks for having me on. And you're a, you're a South African. Originally, yes. Originally. Well, uh, we like AEI. Now, so the G7 is, or excuse me, G7, G20 is coming up. It would seem to me that Trump has a heck of a lot on his plate. I don't remember a time in recent history where American pre- an American president had so many issues to bring to the G20 or the G7 or, frankly, any general international conference. Let's just kind of tick them off and you'll see if we've missed any. Uh, first of all, you've got. Brexit, maybe first and foremost, he's got to figure out what the American role is in Brexit. I guess uh, Theresa May and the EU have worked things out. Now it's Parliament's got to pass it. First question is, what's the American role? Second thing, the Saudis, Trump's got, obviously, I think he has to back the Saudis on this thing. You don't want a major uh, a break in U.S.-Saudi relations over Kashkagi. On the other hand, Trump has to play that delicately. Number three, the Russians Uh, Now, Putin senses that America is distracted, so he wants to go back in Crimea and start fooling around in the Ukraine again. And then we've got, perhaps most of all, uh, we've got all of these issues, and we've got a whole plethora of issues, maybe too numerous to even count, with China, who will be there and is now the number two in the G20. What say you? You do have the issues right, but I would order them somewhat differently in that China is obviously from an economic point of view going to be the key issue. Uh, The issue there is whether or not we can dial down the temperature on the trade war, whether Trump can get some concessions from the Chinese that would allow him to delay introducing additional tariffs or raising the tariff rate. And I think that that's where most of the attention uh, is going to be focused from an economic point of view, because if we do go down the route of the trade war, uh, that can have really very big consequences for the markets. We're talking about the world's second largest economy. So, if well, see, I, correct States, me if I'm wrong. You're the I'm hardly an expert in trade. I mean, I but correct me if I'm wrong. But it seems to me that this whole thing in politics, you want the issue, you don't want the result. I believe from the start that Trump and Kudlow and the economic team never had any intention of doing any serious tariffs. They might do something short term. I think all this is just political posturing. Trump knows you can't do tariffs. The global manufacturing chains are way too complicated for that. I mean, in today's world, it's not just buying something from China. You've got manufacturing may start in America, go to China. They manufacture another piece in Indonesia. Then it goes to Korea, back to China, back to America. You know, there's no more tariffs don't even make sense anymore. It's like saying um, the analogy would be to something like a black hole where you have nine or 10 D space. You know what does time? It's like what does time mean in a black hole? You go in one side, come out the other. Time only has relevance in in 3D space. You know, do I have it assessed right? Well, you've certainly got it assessed right in terms of supply chains and how disruptive it would be if we went down the route to a trade war. It seems, though, that there's been a change in the way in which the U.S., or should I say this administration, is viewing China. We're viewing China no longer as a potential economic partner and that this can lead to global prosperity and all of that. We're rather viewing China right now as a strategic threat to the United States, and that this has to be stopped. Well, but it's not, it's not one or the other. They're not mutually exclusive, right? You could be a strategic threat and a, and a uh, great economic partner, right? We're now taking issue with them stealing our technology, wanting to outpace us in a whole range of technical areas. 
and they're really challenging our global leadership that they're messing around in the South China Sea, that they're really being more expansionist. We're wanting to try and curtail that. And it seems that the Trump administration is putting aside the economic issues. My view is that that's a great mistake because, as I mentioned, having the world's second largest economy and the economy that's been the main engine for global growth over the last decade, to have that stumble, uh, one really is playing with fire. I agree. I agree with you. I mean, the whole Let's digress for a minute into the military side. I mean, the U.S., I think, has 13 active carriers. The Chinese, I believe, have one. Uh, and, and that's I dry docked. I mean, if, if we ever had to fight a conventional naval war in the Pacific, China is certainly not ready to take on the United States. I don't see much of a strategic military threat. Do you? Well, the point is, is that China is growing at a very rapid rate. It's really changing. You know, not so long ago, it was very backward economy. Now we're talking about the second largest economy. I guess what the Trump administration is doing is that they're not simply looking at where China is now. They're looking at the path on which China is, where it's going to be in 2025. China's got great ambitions, and that makes the Trump administration See, feel uncomfortable, and they're trying to yeah. – Make I'm with you. Difficult. I'm with you, Desmond, and I think we should be more focused on economic growth and seeing China as an economic partner because China as a threat, I don't see China as a great strategic threat for a number of reasons. Number one, I think the size of their economy is drastically overrated. I mean, if you look at the U.S. is like 18 and a half trillion, the Chinese may be close to 12 trillion right about now. I think that 12 trillion dollar number is very, very inflated. And I think there, there, you do not have reliable statistics coming out of China. I've seen that in business, and I think you see the same thing at the macro level. That's my overall belief. I think that economy is it's the second largest, but it's much, much smaller than that. That's my belief. And then the other thing is, again, just looking at the just looking at the whole growth as China grows, China will have all the growing pains and problems we did. I mean, they, China could have its own civil war. China could have uh, uh, oh, China could have to do its Medicare, its Social Security. China will have all the growing pains the U.S. has had for the last 200 years. Uh, maybe I see China where the U.S. was in the year 1880 or something like that. Yeah, I, I agree with you that. China's economic strength and its prospects are overrated, not simply because of the measurement problems with its GDP, but China is basically a bubble economy. We've never seen a credit bubble like the one that China has gone through with big increases in housing prices, commercial property prices, overcapacity in many industries. China's got clay feet. Uh, that is the view that I'd take. It doesn't seem to be the view that the Trump administration's taking. One should just look at the kind of speech that Mike Pence has made now on a couple of occasions, you know, indicating that this administration really looks at China as a strategic threat. And what they're doing is they're issuing China an ultimatum. You know, either you reverse your policies in terms of stealing our technological secrets or let me ask you this now just in the time remaining let's go quickly uh we know the saudi the brexit issue what should trump do on brexit well he shouldn't do what he's doing right now which is to try to to torpedo the deal you know because if that deal doesn't get through uh, we can have quite a lot of political No, no why why would trump why would trump care what are american interests in torpedoing brexit Trump believes that uh, uh, he w he's very much in favor of a hard Brexit. He's in favor of the U.K. leaving, making a clean cut from the uh, EU, having a different relationship with the United States, a much closer relationship. Uh, but as I say, uh, what he's done in the last few days is to try to undermine Theresa May's efforts to get the deal through that they've got. If that deal fails, we're really going to have a lot of political chaos in the UK. We could eventually see new elections. In the worst case scenario, we could see Jeremy Corbyn become prime minister. Oh, that would be I worst case indeed. Right. I don't think you're wanting to pay with fire. Uh, you know, you should really try to support uh, what Mrs. May is Corbyn's doing. A lot like, Corbyn's a lot like Pelosi. He's a wily survivor. All right. Now, quick, one quick thing before we exit here. Russia, 
What should he do with Putin, Crimea and the Ukraine? I would say that he should be having a tougher line with them. But what he should be doing is he should be cooperating with his European partners. You know, I think that trying to sow discord amongst the Europeans isn't the way to go. You know, that they're really on the front line. We should really keep the pressure on uh, the Russians, but we should really work with our partners. Desmond Lachman. Great to have you. If we're real lucky, we'll be able to have you back again. Resident Fellow, American Enterprise Institute, and all-around expert in global macro and microeconomics. Desmond, thank you so much. All the stories and controversies that no one talks about, but everyone should know about. Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking. Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Welcome back to Behind the Curtain. Well, we're heading into a discussion of General Motors and manufacturing in the United States. Do we pine stupidly for the past? Ed Sincoris will join us in just a few minutes. He's a contributing editor at Manufacturing Engineering. He runs a company called Toolroom Solutions, and he's an all-around all expert in the modern and critical issue of manufacturing. Remember, if you want to take it behind the curtain, you call us 703 703- 795-5364, 703-795-5364. Operator standing by to take your call 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Taking your emails now, we come into the 20th century, but not the 21st just yet anyway. Jack Berkman 2016 at Gmail. Same number, same email. If you know anything about the Seth Rich murder mystery, 703 703- 795-5364. We will never quit on the Rich family, never quit on the city of Washington. We will find the killer or killers of Seth. Now fully two and a half years into that investigation. Ed, welcome. Thanks. Nice to be, nice to be with you. Well, the whole thing, I mean, the big news this week, obviously what's triggering the segment, GM laying off 15,000 people. I think they blindsided the Donald. I don't think he had much notice about this. And, of course, that's a real shot in the eye. Democrats can use that because now Trump becomes accountable. And those are very those aren't just jobs. Those are very politically visible jobs. It's General Motors. And now we lose 15,000 jobs. So Trump's got to uh, find a way to talk his way out of that one. But the, the broader issue is, do we unfairly pine for the past? In other words, is not this whole manufacturing thing just plain stupid? I mean, why would we want to organize the economy the way we did in the 1960s? Shouldn't we pay more interest to the future, Uh, uh, more advanced services, IT, robotics, uh, those things that make America great today, not in the year 1960? The simple answer to your question is yes. (laughs) I like it. Uh, I mean, you, you, you picked me up through the recent article I wrote for Manufacturing Engineering. We did. Uh, which, is trying to envi- which is trying to envision what manufacturing will look like in 2050, and that's perhaps you know, too far for some people to be thinking. But the, but the gist of that article is correct for five years from now or 10 years from now and beyond, which is to say there's an ever greater degree of automation in manufacturing. Uh, what we traditionally think of as employment in manufacturing is is has already changed tremendously, as you're suggesting, and will continue to do so. Uh, well, there just aren't there just will not be a need for thousands of people on factory floors doing what people have been doing. I guess what the left will say: the left is both left and right pine for the the old days because both are concerned about this populist angle of what do we do with all these people. Is it the case that through immigration, we have just made the country a lot bigger than it needs to be or should be? In other words, maybe the problem is we have too many people running around. I mean, do we need 335 million people? Maybe that maybe there's nothing wrong with the economy. It's just we've created too many people and now we have to find something for them to do. Well, you're you're asking me about things that are at least presumably outside my realm of expertise, uh, you know, in the context of, again, the article and my work within manufacturing, but based on everything I've read, immigration has been a net benefit for this country from its beginning. And I don't think the issue, in fact, you can make the argument that the one reason we're in better financial shape than many other Western democracies is because we have a growing well, that's vibrant true. population. That's true, but it's all beside the point, it, it, right? Because that doesn't answer the question of whether we still have a population that's too big. 
you know, maybe the optimal point on the curve, if we're looking for the optimal point on the curve as demographers, maybe that's 270 million. I don't know. I'm just, obviously, you're not a demographer. I'm just thinking, I mean, we don't clearly. All right, let me ask you, here's something well within your realm. We're going to need fewer and fewer bodies as all this continues, right? Because robotics and drones, I mean, you know, there's going to come a day in the, sh- in the near future where Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks and all this stuff is drones to your door. We have on our street in Arlington, Virginia, there's this woman that it's kind of like a toy now. It's like a Christmas children's toy. But she gets her coffee and donuts from Dunkin' Donuts here in Arlington, Virginia, delivered by drone. Now, at this point, there's no real reason to do that other than it's like a, a conversation piece. But clearly... Automation with drones and robotics is coming, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And and everybody looks at that and, you know, kind of runs out of the room in panic because you, we don't know what those other jobs are. But, you know, historically, there's always been another job. There's always been something else that those people end up doing. That's and, true. You that, you're right. Earlier, so, you know, the canal. It's, maybe it's services. I mean, maybe we'll all paint pictures. I mean, who knows what it'll be when we're no longer doing the kind of drudgery that some of us now do on factory floors. I mean, by the way, there's very little of that that goes on. There's very little of that. I mean, the, the, you know, in the 18th century, they worried about the the, uh, automation of larger carriages and horses and roads being more efficient. 19th century trains, 20th century airplanes. I mean, the whole middle of the country was predicted to die. I mean, in some sense it did, but I mean, we model on, we push on, right? We push, humans push through it. Exactly. I mean, the, 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 I think it's actually a rather positive situation because the jobs that are being created are ever more creative and interesting jobs. Now, let's look, though. Let's, that. But there's a big problem, though, and that is that left and right, at least in their political rhetoric, if not reality, continue to pine for the year 1960. How big is this problem? Is it that Trump, whom I like and is doing good things with the economy, but is it is it the case that with respect to this, he's taking us stupidly into the past? Uh, again, I think the simple answer is yes. OK, <laughs> I mean, if if we're he, if we're he's taking us, uh, you know, to take another example, which is a little bit off topic, you know, coal. Yep. I mean, should we be you know, should we be restructuring things in order to burn more coal? I mean, there's all sorts of great arguments for why. No, the answer is no. Right. I mean, we get all kinds of great cleaner energy because of the natural gas revolution in this country. So it's bad for people that have been mining coal. But, you know, from a policy standpoint, it doesn't seem to make sense that that's the direction we should be going. And, you know, by the same token, trying to rejigger the economy because you think there should be whatever the number is, you know, 10,000 people assembling such and such a vehicle. Again, it's not. It's See, not, I think uh, part of the part of the problem is there's this myth. The myth is that working class people did better in the 1950s than they do today. Now, certainly, we all know that's not true in absolute terms, but in relative terms, that's true because the top and bottom are closer together in those days. But the only reason top and bottom are further apart is we've created such spectacular wealth in this country that that you couldn't have it otherwise. Because that's what happens when any society gets gets rich. Do you agree that by any standard, working people are much better off today than they were in the 1960s? Well, you just actually threw out two interesting statistics, and I, I think you're right about all of it. But I do think there is there is a valid concern with the notion that there's such a premium for certain kinds of whatever you all want to right, call it. All right, Ed Sinkoris. Ed that- We'll finish this another time. Contributing editor at Manufacturing okay. Engineering runs Toolroom Solutions, a great company. Thanks. Portions of today's program were broadcast at an earlier date. This is a universe where everything is depicted as a Washington Post political cartoon. Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. And up next, we're going to be talking all about is America at a crossroads? Are we going to still be a world leader? Will we still be a world power? Are we falling from within like Rome? Are we Rome? Coming up in just a few seconds. But remember, if you want to take something behind the curtain... You call us, 703-795-5364, 703-795-5364. Operators standing by, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. 
to 5 p.m., Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., all times Eastern Standard Time, taking your emails, jackberkman2016 at gmail, jackberkman2016 at gmail, same number, same email. If you know anything about the Seth Rich murder mystery, it is heating up. We're about to have the next dump of information. The Seth murder will be solved. We will never quit on the family. We'll never quit on the city of Washington. We will honor our commitment to solve this murder. Well, joining us now, John Smirak, senior editor at The Stream. John, welcome. Thank you. Good to be on. Well, so this topic here, it's kind of an unusual topic. We're taking a step back from day-to-day politics. How do, it's a very broad topic. How do we see America? Are we still the preeminent nation in the world? Are we declining? Are we Rome? Is it inevitable that we're Rome? Are we, are we being eclipsed by China? Will we be eclipsed by China? Are we a hegemon in a multipolar world? What do you think? Well, um, I talk about a lot of these things in my new book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Immigration, where I, I go into what is America? How do we define it? How did immigration shape America? And how is the current wave of immigration, which is very different from previous waves, uh, challenging and maybe undermining our, our, current, our current American identity? And, and we see that the Democrats have really bet the farm on this. Uh, now, I think, I, know, I, think I know where you're going with this. And tell me if you agree with me. One of the things, one of the big problems I have with the current direction of the country, I mean, we're all immigrants. So we're all, except Native Americans, every one of us is an immigrant. My family, I'm half Italian. The Italians came to this country at the turn of the 20th century. I think uh, my, on my mother's side, they came in the year 1905, 1910, somewhere around there, through Ellis Island, then on to Pittsburgh, just like, just same way as millions of other people. But here's the difference between then and now. My people wanted to integrate. You know, the old Italians, when the children would speak Italian at the dinner table, they would slap them and they say, no, you speak English. You speak English. That's not being done today. See, the Italians were successful because they integrated into the society. The Irish did the well, same also, thing. Well, also, the society Everybody demanded it. Wait, wait, let me ask you. The society demanded it. There was demanded. no welfare state. One out of three Italian, Amer- Italian immigrants went back. One out of three. How many immigrants from America, in America today decide they can't find a job, it's not comfortable, so they go back? Now, you don't get one in three because we have a welfare state that traps. Even for illegals. We've, we've essentially got a whole welfare state even for illegals. That's right. Their kids get free education. The kids get Medicaid. Their kids, I mean, it, it, you are better off on American welfare than you are working hard in large parts of the world. Think about that. You are better off just collecting a check from the government, maybe getting something through affirmative action in America as, it, as, it, as an immigrant without a job than you would be if you went back to Honduras or Mexico but and worked 50, Even more dan- I, I love that point, but even more dangerous than that is the separatism. Like if you look at the Hispanic community, and somewhat it's difficult to talk about the Hispanic community because they're really 18 different groups. It's a very, uh, the media right. says Hispanics, right. that's 18 or 20 different groups of people it does, or more. It doesn't make a lot of sense to use that word. But the problem is the Hispanic leadership uh, like the African American leadership is encouraging separatism. That is, speak. We want you to speak Spanish, and, and you know, Bank of America and Wells Fargo. They now have everything in English and Spanish. Diversity, in and of itself, is not a good thing. What is a good thing is diversity with common culture. Diversity with common culture, with common language, with common tradition. Diversity with integration. Diverse societies historically fail. Like if you look at Austria-Hungary or the Soviet Empire or for that matter, the Persian Empire, for that matter, the Russian or the uh, Roman Empire, they all they collapse. But what has made America different is diversity with all that commonality. Right. 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 And, And actually, now that school textbooks in America, I've got a chapter on this in the book, are school textbooks the ones that are official in California, which is our largest state and imposes itself on many other states? They just adopt California's books. Their their U.S. history book teaches that the assimilation of immigrants, that encouraging immigrants to learn English and become loyal Americans was racist, that it was racist to expect all those Southern Europeans, like my grandfather, who came from Croatia in 1916, it was racist to expect him to learn English and adhere to American democracy. If you're going to be teaching that to the kids you're trying allegedly to assimilate, how on earth is it ever going to happen? So we'd be, we would be, under that logic, we would be exactly like 
the Aust- we would be exactly like Austria-Hungary, and we would already have met the same fate because you'd have people, you'd have uh, 16 different major languages in the United States. People would be speaking right. Polish and Italian and Croat and Russian right. and on down the line, and there would be no commonality of any kind. America would never have been, we would have never won World War II. We would never, we would never have even won the Civil War. We would have, the Civil War, <laughs> and, and furthermore, um, the other effect of mass immigration is, is, is also destructive. Right now, we bring in almost a million low-skill workers every year, at the same time that we've outsourced low-skill jobs to third-world countries. And as a result, the average working man, the working-class woman, the wor- average working-class salary in America has not risen in 45 years adjusted for inflation. They have been st- economically stagnant because supply and demand. The demand for their labor is reducing as we outsource jobs, and we, we're constantly flooding them with competitors brought in from other countries. The irony Millions is Millions of people the policies, don't have high school diplomas. The policies of the far left are destroying the working man. And I don't even know if Bernie Sanders is smart enough to know this. I don't know if... Uh, if all of these socialists know that their policy, their immigration policies are essentially destroying the American working man and the American union. Now, Donald Trump, to his credit, has turned this around. And we're now seeing numbers for the first time. We see wages going up. We see relative right. differences shrinking. Trump, as a conservative Republican, is really the first president ever to address this. Right, and the Koch brothers, who are radical open borders libertarians, are angry about that, and they're threatening to try to destroy Trump. They're they're these libertarian billionaires, and they're they're going to pour money into never Trump candidates and even support Democrats. I I have a theory. I have a theory on this. We'll see if you agree with me. In the at the beginning in the twentieth century, we started using the words immigration and emigration because they're nice, neutral sounding words. But what's going on today is the same debate that America has been bedeviled by since the get-go, and that is the slavery debate, the slavery question. We don't use the word slavery. What the Koch brothers want to do, what the Chamber of Commerce want to do, they want to run slave ships. They want to bring all these people in. Now, nobody ties them down and puts them on plantations and beats them, but the society is richer. These people, a lot of the people coming over the border, are the equivalent in relative terms of modern-day slaves. And the, the Especially illegal immigrants. Illegal my, immigrants are not protected by workplace re- protections, by insurance, by any of the safety things. They basically work under the conditions of people in 1880. It's you slavery. Know? I mean, every labor law we passed is nullified by the fact that employers don't have to check if a, someone is legal to work in the country. Most Americans don't realize that. Employers do not have to check if you are legal to work in this country. There is a program called E-Verify. The Fed set it up. It's voluntary. Paul Ryan has fought to keep it voluntary. Why? What conceivable reason can there be to let illegal workers with stolen Social Security numbers work in America? Well, it's just because, well, I think the answer is because the chamber, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce wants to run slave ships, just like a yeah. lot of American business always did. But we don't learn our lesson. Slavery is bad and it's wrong. And more than that, it doesn't work. It caused the Civil War and 600,000 deaths. And it's still causing problems today. We have most all of the labor we need in the United States. But so people can squeeze out additional profits. Certain groups can do that. We are running slaves. And I have argued that I've argued that for a long time. If I were in Congress, I would get rid of the word immigration, bring back the word slavery and tell the American people the evil we are really dealing with. Well, you know, it was it, the real force behind ending slavery in the 19th century. It was not just the abolitionists who made a very strong moral case based on the Bible. It was it was the free soil people. It was ordinary workers who didn't want to have to compete with slave labor. So the, 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 you can combine a moral cause with a, a, a cause of legitimate self-interest. And I think Trump combines the moral cause of defending Christians and other religious groups in America from government persecution, defending the rights of the unborn to live, defending our nationhood and defending the economic interests of the working man and woman who has been completely neglected by, by the libertarian right who, who wants to use them as cheap labor and by the multiculturalist left, which is just has given up. John Smirak, running out of time. Last few seconds. What is your book again? 
I want to the make politically sure. incorrect guide to immigration. The politically incorrect guide to immigration. John Smirak, senior editor of the Stream. John, if we're real lucky, we'll be able to have you back again. Stay tuned. Coming back soon. Portions of today's program were broadcast at an earlier date. All the stories and controversies that no one talks about, but everyone should know about. Why don't you get a toupee with some brains in it? Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Welcome back. In just a minute, we'll be talking about the ill effects of America's small population. This is a theme that Behind the Curtain has been on for some time. But remember, if you want to take it behind the curtain, if nobody's listening to you, if your local press won't help, call us, 703-795-5364, 703-795-5364. Operators standing by 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday. We're ready to take your call. We're ready to take your issue to Congress, and we'll do it for free. We don't want anything from you. We just want to know what you need. And if your local press won't help you, behind the curtain will. Also, remember, same number, 703-795-5364, Jack Berkman 2016 at Gmail. If you know anything about the Seth Rich murder mystery, more coming on that soon. Well, joining us now, Jordan Goodman. Frequent, wonderful contributor uh, to this program, personal finance finance expert, America Money Answers Man. That's like that's like that old thing, Jordan, where you would say toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. Remember that one? Yeah. How many times can you say Money Answers Man without screwing it up? Welcome, Jordan. No, no, America's Money Answers Man. That's what people call me. I love it, and and that is a well earned and well deserved title because you are exactly that. Okay, I want to talk. We've talked about so many economic themes with you, but one thing I want to talk to you about today that we haven't talked about. I am very concerned about the smallness of America. And that is, if you look into the future, my feeling is that demography might just be destiny. And that's that's what worries me. How can we compete? Okay, so, you know, we have this left-right battle, and obviously you and I are on the right, and yes, I believe in a free market system, but all of the difference between left and right is the difference between growing America at 1% like a Barack Obama and even 7 or 8% like Donald Trump. But my point is a broader one. If you take a step back and take a deep look, even if we grow at 8% forever, we're still not going to be able to compete with 3 billion plus Asians. That is correct. And so what's happening is we are not replacing our population. Our birth rate, uh, typically if you have two child uh, per family, you replace your uh, population. And we're under that. We're about 1.6, last numbers I heard, uh, because people of childbearing age are either not having children at all, or they're having them later and later in life. Um, And some people are just going childless. So we are not replacing our population. We're getting older and older. It's even worse than that, in that our fertility rates are even lower than Europe, Japan, and Russia. But the problem is we have enough immigration to offset that whereas Europe really doesn't. Europe has even worse problems with immigration than we do, and Japan and Russia are actually losing people because of the low birth rate. We, too, would be losing people, but for immigration, which brings a whole nother can of worms and a whole nother group of problems. Well, when we're restricting immigration, both legal and illegal, so that has always been the escape valve for us in the past, and that's why you're seeing labor shortages, Jack. In many areas, but go to construction sites. You can't find people to work at them. But one of the problems, and people, it's very controversial to talk about this, so people don't want to. One of the problems is that the top 80% or 85% of the society is basically not breeding. And certainly the top half of the society is not breeding. I mean, it's any society that essentially breeds out the bottom doesn't have much of a future, right? And, you know, if you look back in time, uh, Top grade families from the top of society would have four, five, six children. That was common if you go back a hundred years. We're not doing that anymore. Correct. That that can seal our doom. It is a problem. I mean, you look at what's happening now in Japan, um, Italy, other places. Similar. I mean, the, Japan's a very old society in many ways. Actually, another interesting place, Jack, is China. Now, they had the one child policy for many, many years. I, I was in China a summit recently, and they said. <clears throat> had they not had the one-child policy, there would be 400 million people more in China than there are today because they only had and one And it gets child. even worse. The Chinese story is even sadder because if you go back to the Mao days and you look at 1947 to the, to the mid-1970s, you have a situation where, I mean, Mao was probably the greatest butcher in history. He probably killed more people than Hitler and Stalin combined. 
And uh, probably the numbers I'm getting are, I mean, you, you, you could, it could be upwards of 100 million plus that he killed. Had you not had that tragic killing, I mean, and had you not done the one-child policy, had you not had the tragic actions of Mao, China could well be over 3 billion people, in, in which case it would be a total zoo and a total disaster. Yeah, but I mean, from our point of view, you are correct. You need a growing population uh, to grow the economy. I mean, we're growing at a 4% GDP rate right now, which is pretty amazing considering the baby boom is retiring. 10,000 people a day turn 65. Trump's done a brilliant job with what he has to work with. But the bottom line in this country, because of the aging population, because of the smallness of it, uh, Trump doesn't have a whole lot to work with. So, I mean, do you think... What are the causes of this? And again, let's get real controversial. My feeling is the main cause of all of this is the feminist movement. Because feminism means, with the, see, we delude ourselves. If you look at the last 50 years, a lot of the growth we've had is because women and minorities have entered the workplace. Whereas if you go back 50 years ago, the only people really working in the United States, at least in full-time jobs, were, were white males. So you bring women into this calculation, it's easy to see how the country has become a lot richer. We have become richer but we, in some sense, I would argue, have sown the seeds of our own destruction because we don't have enough children, specifically children from the top half of the society. Correct. So women, uh, I mean, either they have no children at all, or they certainly wait till their mid to late 30s or even 40s to have one child because they want to establish their careers, which I guess you could say is because of feminism. I think it's good they have careers, but we need children uh, as well. And you're right. Actually, it's interesting. Just this last weekend, I was in Newport. And I was seeing some of the mansions, uh, the, the breakers and all that kind Quite of thing. Quite a up there. Big, uh, big, uh, in those days, the Vanderbilts and the Astros, they had big families. And they needed those big mansions. The Rockefellers, the Melons, all of them. Exactly. All <laughs> Today, of them. Today, you wouldn't need those kind of mansions. Because maybe one kid, maybe, maybe two. Uh, there was a whole story recently about the, the death of the middle child. There's people not having three kids anymore. So it, it is a long-term problem demographically because the baby boom, which was the biggest you know, uh, surge of population is now getting in the retired years and and they're receiving benefits. They're not paying into the system. As Let's much. take a careful look at where the world is now. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, clearly the U.S. is still number one. China is rising. I mean, would you would you say in economic terms that we're developing a bipolar world with U.S. and China at the top? Or do we still have the U.S. as a hegemon presiding over a multipolar system? How do you see the current world? No, I think the U.S., I mean, we're still number one, and we're throwing our weight around with all the tariffs and all that. But China is growing, uh, and Europe's doing better, not as much as you know they, they could be if they didn't have their kind of rigid policies. But Europe is still very large. For example, Europe just had a big uh, trade treaty with Japan, which was the largest trade treaty ever in human history, a quarter of the world's population there. As far as population growth, it's all happening in uh, India and Bangladesh and uh, you know, poor people. Africa has a very high population rate. So around the world, uh, another place is the Arab world, Egypt and Iraq, very high population. But these people have nothing to do. But That's Europe, why they have 25 percent unemployment rates. Europe and Japan have so many internal problems and Europe's birth rates are even lower. And Europe has even worse immigration problems with Arab immigration. These societies, I don't see Japan and Europe, Europe as having any kind of future. I see them really shrinking on the world stage. I see the U.S. and China emerging. And so let me ask you this. Let's take a look at some of this Chinese economic data because you're the expert. A lot of this, I, I, I don't know what to make, how to make heads or tails of it. The U.S. economy is about $18.5 trillion. The Chinese economy is $11, $11.5 trillion on most of the uh, statistics. Now, that's not purchasing power parity. That's just raw numbers. Is the Chinese number of $11 trillion, how accurate do you think that is? Is that inflated I mean, there's been so much growth in the last 10 years. Is that, could the number, real number, be half that? What do you suspect about China? I, don't, I think it's inflated somewhat, not half. But it's, I mean, I've been there, and you can actually see it. There's a huge amount of infrastructure that's been built all over the place, in Shanghai. And, and I mean, I, w- I took the bullet train from Beijing to Shanghai. It's five hours. And everywhere you're seeing apartment buildings going up. Office, a lot of times they're empty, <laughs> but it's part of GDP. So I think maybe they're at $10 trillion, something like that. But they're growing at a faster pace. They're growing at maybe 6%, something like that. Although recently, they're taking a big hit. They are losing the trade war. And you've seen this, the Chinese stock market fall sharply. 
And they're very much of an export-oriented country, and they're getting hurt more by the trade war than we are. We're much less of an export-oriented country than China. Maybe it's time for the U.S. to, to use its leverage, just as Trump is doing. Maybe there comes a time when you think more about relative differences than absolute gain. And that's what's happening. We are using our leverage, and they're not happy about it. Now, whether they concede, I hope they do. I mean, the, the solution to this whole tariff situation, President Trump is right, if you get either no tariffs or much lower tariffs and fewer uh, protections and All price right, support. Jordan Goodman, we're going to leave it there. Personal finance expert, America's money answers. Man, what a blessing to have you. We'll see you again soon. Well, thanks a lot, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, even when we're not on the air, you can hear us and see us and read all about us at jackberkmanradio.com and at radioamerica.com. See you next week. But I want to tell you now about something very special. My friends at my pillow and we are so proud to represent them these are if you have trouble sleeping these are some of the best pillows you could ever have they're 100 percent cotton they come with a 10-year warranty uh, my wife and i had trouble sleeping for years when we had my pillow all of that went away I, I i can't remember the time we got our first four pillows it was a spectacular experience now my pillow a four pack right now if you want to buy four 50 percent off two premium two travel pillows Uh, MyPillow.com or 1-800-923-8919, 1-800-923-8919, promo code Berkman. Uh, MyPillow.com, 1-800-923-8919. If you want to take it behind the curtain, you call us, 703-795-5364, 703-795-5364. Taking your emails, JackBerkman2016 at Gmail. JackBerkman2016 at Gmail. Same number, same email. If you know anything about Seth Rich. Ladies and gentlemen, even when we're not on the air, you can hear us and see us and read all about us at jackberkmanradio.com. And of course, always at radioamerica.com. Thanks, and my voice is gone.